Good evening, everyone. It's Camera Work Podcast number 10. And it's nine minutes after midnight, and I'm in Portland, Oregon, thanks to one of my two guests here today. And I'm going to introduce the two of those, these people to you. So the person to my immediate left is, I know him as P. Frank. Now, is that the only name you use, or do you use another name besides that? Are you affiliated with the government? <laughs> no, and no one listening is either. Okay. P. Frazy. <laughs> Freezy Fonzarelli. No other name. P. Frank Williams is the whatever. Okay, so P. Frank Williams, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to get deep into your story in a minute, but we're actually going to talk to the other guests first. Perfect. But for the short version, you are a producer, and you currently work on a show called Unsung, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. And you're like the, what, executive producer? Is I'm a producer of that show. A producer of yeah. that show. Okay, now we're going to get deep into your story because there's a whole lot of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But... Let's get to the next guest first. And your name, sir, is? Mitchell Jackson. Okay. Now, Mitch was actually a guest on Camera Work Podcast number seven. Mitch Kupchak. Okay. Right. Mitch Ketcher. Kupchak. Okay. But he was a guest on number seven. Yes. And he is an author. He mm -hmm. currently has a book called Oversoul that's on iBooks and I think Amazon as well. Everywhere eBooks are available. Good. And he's... Also teaches at NYU, which I think is super cool because both my brother and sister graduated from there. Oh, wow. And in addition to that, he has a book called The Residue Years, which is coming out in August. August. Right. Now, last time we primarily spoke to you about like the difference between the way writers do personal work and photographers do or the need to do personal work. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because that's really why we're here. There's a personal project that mm -hmm. you came up with that's sort of connected to the book The Residue Years mm -hmm. and you brought... Myself, P. Frank, and how many other people? We brought one other person, someone named Chris, right? What's Chris's last name? Chris Ewers. Did I say it right? Ewers? Ewers. Ewers. Chris Ewers, and we're going to bring him on in a few minutes when you break. But He's over there doing some fedangling with the fedangles, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, he's, he's working. <laughs> he's, it's 10 after midnight. He's actually downloading. That like I'm playing with myself. <laughs> he's actually downloading some cards from some of the stuff we shot today. Yeah. So... We're all here, and then you actually hired like what three guys? You hired, but oh, wait, you hired like three local guys as well. Yes. So we've got like six people working on a personal project of yeah. yours. So what is that project? Just explain that to us. So the project uh, is a documentary project that uh, chronicles the the. Go a little uh, bit louder for me. The chronicles. The project is a documentary project that chronicles. Uh, my journey from um, this place where we are, well, we're not in the actual place now, but from Northeast Portland to uh, New York from a, a, uh, an aspiring basketball player slash uh, part-time drug dealer to a, uh, an, uh, a writer. Right. Uh, and, um, and then also about the... the uh, the obstacles involved in, in publishing a, a book. Right. Okay. Now, I think your story is tremendously interesting. Like you said, at one point, you were in high school in Portland. It looked like you might make some moves in basketball, mm -hmm. right? But Portland is a certain type of city with a lot of crazy stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And what did you end up involved with instead of basketball? Uh well, I don't know if it was instead of basketball, but it was along with basketball. And it was the other thing that's really Portland is known for, but not a lot of people know for. And that's, you know, the illicit uh, drug dealing. Mm. So for a couple of years, I thought I could make a living selling drugs. I did make a living selling drugs. Right. You were actually very successful. What were you driving? Uh, I wasn't that successful, but I was an, successful enough to... Uh, Get a couple of trinkets. But what were you driving? Uh, at the end of it, a Lexus. All right, that's pretty successful, right? How much <laughs> cash did you have in the house at the point where you were arrested? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Would it be over ten thousand? Yeah. Over forty thousand? Probably not. Maybe okay. close to that. All right, but that's still good money. But so at some point you actually got arrested. Mm. You did some time. Then you came out, and what is your current main source of income is? My main source of income is teaching. Right, at? 
NYU. Yeah, so that's a really cool story, and you drew from that story when you went to write this novel called The Residue Years. Yes. And some of that story is also in Oversoul, which is the ebook. So, right. what is the project we're working on now? It's not a story. What is it? Why are we all in Portland? What are well, we it is a on? story, but it's 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 documenting on film a journey that I hope resonates with other people, like uh, you know. And it's and not even for us. It's, it's documenting a story. It's more of like an exploration right. on film. Right. And the thing that's interesting is, is to the best of my knowledge, you started this project with me. Is that correct? Pre- uh, yeah, mo- yeah, pretty much. You were at right. the beginning stage of this. Yeah. Right. Because I shot a lot of stuff for you, and yeah. I'm primarily a photographer. I do some video, but mm-hmm. like video is so different from photography because there's so much more technical aspect to it. Mm-hmm. You can't do video alone, mm-hmm. and most of it I was doing alone. Mm-hmm. You know, I just have like the Nikon D3s, and I'm shooting video, and I'm trying to do sound, mm-hmm. and you know, I, it can't be done alone. So that's mm-hmm. why we've got a whole bunch of people and. Mm-hmm. To me, if you really, really want to pull it together, mm-hmm. you need a producer, mm-hmm. which is where P. Frank comes in, right? right? Now, how do you know that? Uh, P. Frank and I met, shit, 12, 13 years ago now. Right. Um, we were at a writing workshop, and uh, I guess we, it was all black writing workshops, so I don't really know how we hooked up. Probably because there was a bunch of squares there, and we was like the coolest stuff there. True. And, uh, Preach. Tabernacle. <laughs> And, uh, we church. we kind of hit it off, and then we just uh, we kept in contact. Like I, the first time I went to New York, he I think he took me to the source or something, invited me up to right. the source, let me now, see the office. We're gonna talk about your past mm-hmm. and what no, you currently. You, you look like the final. <laughs> Certain right. parts of your past we will talk about, but not all of it. Okay. okay. Suspicious though. But before we are you white? Like, <laughs> That, that, <laughs> we only have an hour on the oh, podcast. Okay. I'm just all wondering this. Okay, okay, okay. i got to investigate you. Rather than get into these other aspects of your life for the moment, let's just stick directly to this project, right? Okay. So <clears throat> what is it that you are doing on this project over the – over the? we were here two days. We've been here two days now? Yes. We've been here two days. We have one more day. What is your job here? Uh, I'm just like a uh, field conductor, Phil Jackson. Just right. coach to make sure we all – like Kobe and Shaq, they get along. Dennis, you know, Dennis probably had some bras last night. You know what I mean? He did a little few lines. Right. Make well, sure but that's not what you're doing here. I'm just producing. I'm making sure that this production goes smoothly, that the questions right. are asked, that the story has continuity, that the crew moves, that we keep it moving, that we stay right. on focus, stay on right. time. Which is a lot. Execute it. Because I've been photographing it, so I'm kind mm-hmm. of doing the behind-the-scenes still photography. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting watching you because you're wearing a lot of hats and you're describing In this particular all. job. Right. In this particular but it's job. But it's, it's more... And that's because it pays so well, right? Yes, right. <laughs> but no, it's more about... Uh, it's a personal something. I usually don't do anything that's real. I tell other people stories. Celebrities are people in media. And so this is a real people story that I can identify with. And... You know, I think when we were talking earlier, I guess what you're alluding to is that my job is really about managing people. Right. That's a huge part of it. And dealing with people and their attitudes and feeling, figuring out right. how to make them but, but do what you, you want to do. But you, you're you managing people in more than one capacity. For example, you're managing people in the sense that, like, you're saying to the camera guy, like, is this going to be a two-shot or one-shot? Or which, like, you're saying to Chris, who's the main DP, like, like, well, which camera is doing a tight shot? Who's doing a wide? And you're checking the framing to make sure that... You know, that the framing makes sense to you. So you're managing people in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then if somebody, and I'm not going to name any names, but if somebody says after like a 10-hour day of (laughs) Mitch not giving us any food, if somebody goes, I'm going to run off to Popeye's for five minutes and grab a couple of pieces of chicken because I'm starving, you're the guy. (laughs) He said the chicken. He's like, yo, I need some beans on me. I need some, you know, right? But but you're the guy who says to me. That was a bad idea for the team. uh, For the team, it was a bad (laughs) idea. It was a really good idea for me. Right now. (laughs) Right. We only got one time all left. Right. So, <laughs> what do you like? You got to think we only got one time all left. And we have time. So we need to try to get to this in maybe 30 seconds. We right. got one more shot. But you're the person who said that. But seriously, you were looking at it from the big picture. You were trying to say, you, were, you were going to slow down the whole situation. You were going to go eat. That was going to take time. Right. Everybody else is on the way there. You were making a decision for yourself. I was hungry. Right. right. But at that moment, it would have been better so you could totally chill. Right. Later. Right. right. And you also pointed out, though, that what you didn't want to happen was, like, these guys are setting up in Mitch's father's house for an interview, and then 10 minutes later, yeah, I come walking in, you know. Knocking on the door in the middle of the interview. And right. Stuff with and a chicken bone in my right. hand, right. you're like, But the more important point, though, was that we were all moving together. Right. 
Right, and this is your job. And here's another part of it, though, when you say managing people. And this I thought was particularly interesting. And so one part of the documentary is we have an interview where Mitch is... Mitch is going to have his parents speak to each other as they walk down the block that Mitch grew up in his childhood. Mm -hmm. And if I'm understanding it correctly, your parents didn't have a really great relationship together for a long time. Yeah. They conceived Safe you. Right. They conceived you, and then they separated pretty soon after that. Mm -hmm. So this was an extremely awkward situation for them because they didn't really want to walk down a block and talk to each other. And, of course, Mitch has tried to sell them on the idea, but then you step in as the producer, and it becomes your job as well. Even though you've done some technical stuff earlier, looking at the framing, going, okay, is this framed right? Now you're in a completely different vein going like, how do I get these people to perform on camera in a mm. manner that's going to tell the story that we're mm. trying to tell, right? Mm. So what is that process like for you? What, how do you do that? Ooh. Tim, you got some deep shit to be this late at night and shit. <laughs> Not even that high. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, it's so funny because I have been watching Mitch's dad, who was this kind of laid back, thoughtful guy mm -hmm. and kind of contemplative and very whatever and his mom was kind of loose and just fun and wants to talk it's like a chatty teenager right and so i was like you know she was not happy to be there right he'd be talk to say five words and she'd be like <sighs> yeah like and i got some nice shots that reflect that right like the father's talking to the camera and the mom is just turned away she almost has so what back i'm saying is I, cool. I thought about all of that when i approached them mm -hmm. i didn't come with an absolutist because i it was about the two people mm -hmm. and i understood that's why i asked him what's the deal and she was like this block doesn't mean nothing. He Mitch initially said, "This is the block where they hung out and they courted or whatever." And then he was like, "I've been to this house a couple of times, but you know, nothing happened." Right. And then she was like, "Well, this doesn't mean anything to me because she wasn't. She really didn't want to. What the fuck?" Right. And so I was like, "Well, you two, whatever issues you got or whatever the situation is, is not about you. This is about your son. For the first time in your life, right. you both do something for your son together." Right. And I walked away. Right. Like you, you pulled, like, that was almost like hitting below the belt in a way. Like you pulled whatever cards you to had to pull to get. And the interesting thing was, was, and Mitch wasn't even in the room at this, at, for this, what I'm about to say now, but we interviewed the mom alone after we did the double of them walking on the street. We interviewed right, the right. dad alone. Then today we interviewed the mom alone. And then you complimented her on how well she did with the father yesterday. Right. And she says, I didn't want to do it. I wasn't comfortable doing it. But when you said, do it for Mitch. Do it for your son. That made me step up to the plate and do it. And I was laughing because... That's exactly what I want. That's what you wanted. Right. That's what you wanted to happen. So I think that's interesting how many different hats you have to wear as the producer to make something flow, particularly on a job like this when we're not operating with a full crew. Well, I would have had a DP, but, which I right. have, but I would have had a director. I'm, not, right. I'm a director when right. I have to be, but right. I'm really a producer. Right. But... I needed to kind of direct too. Right. You know what I mean? I would have had a, a field producer. I would have had another whole bunch of three or four PAs. I would have right. had people just driving us. I would have had a whole bunch of other right. shit that I just, you right. know. But the thing is, when you're doing a personal project, then you, you, really, you have to just It was almost better that. because one right. of the things that's been fortunate for this project is that everybody's dedicated and right. they're into it and they're loyal right. for it just because I think they see it. Right. And I think they like Mitch. Right. You know, just like the person said, you were likable to coach. Right. So I think people want to do it for him because usually you right. got motherfuckers on the clock. At four, at five hours, right. I can give people them lunch. don't care. After ten hours, right. they work more than that. It's an hour, a time and a half, right? In a union, and so that's what I normally deal with, right? And so I'm managing them because yeah. when I go back to the and there's a meal the penalty, boxer, right? If they don't penalty, feed you, there's something called a meal penalty. That. And right. so you right. know, whereas I, on this job, there's no meal penalty. They I'm feed you, saying. they don't feed you, and that's why I'm trying to tell Popeyes boy, like yo, we're gonna get to that in a minute. So no, but it's fascinating to be able to do something for the love. It's almost like when you record your first album. Right, just doing it. You know what I mean? And that's right. what's happening here. Right. And I thought the thing we did today was really interesting because we went to a prison. And, you know, as we find out we're going to go to a prison because, again, Mitch was incarcerated for not that long, but he was no. incarcerated for a little while. And we're going to go to the prison. He's going to do a reading there. And the whole time before, I'm making all these jokes. I'm just going to Mitch like, yeah, Mitch, you know, I'm going to sneak a razor blade and a toothbrush. And no one's going to catch me. And I'm like, you know, do you know the policy on them uh, negotiating with hostage takers if we get taken hostage? You know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm joking and stuff. But when we were there, it was really seriously emotional for me because, like, you did your reading, and there was a bunch of people in the room. It was like 30 of them in the room, which is a high number considering that this particular prison holds like 400. Like or 50. Yeah, it's like 50 in a room, and the prison only holds like 450. That's mm -hmm. a tremendous percentage of the people that are there. And when you finish the reading, you ask the question, why are you here? 
And you clarify the question by saying, I don't mean why are you here, how did you get locked up? No, why did you choose to be in this room right now rather than be in that yard? And the theme of their questions when they were asking you questions was like, how do we get out and stay straight the way you did? That was the theme. And all I kept thinking was, was like, man, if anybody's going to get out and stay straight, it's going to be these dudes that are in the room now and not the dudes pumping iron for day number 7,553, yeah. you know? So it was really moving for me. Like I was like choking up just photographing it. And I thank you. And I'm being dead serious. I thank you for giving me a chance to shoot something like that, that to be in that place that was so real and so personal and so emotional rather than just shooting like you know another two chain session or something that you know it's fun i love it but or some pretty girl it's great i love it but it's really cool when you get a chance to shoot something that means something so that was like so cool to be part of it and it was funny to me because like i said i was making all these jokes about it going in because it was funny but when i'm there i'm like choking up going man this is so real you know but what was that like for you to go there and read from the residue years in front of these people who could have been you and who were you, yeah. you know, 15 years ago. Um, the reading part, aside from my technical difficulties of not being able to see my text because it was on my computer, which, you know, how long have I known I was going to do this? For a long time, I shouldn't have had that shit handled. Yeah, but I mean, it was good. I mean, it was yeah. good that you were able to, you know. I mean, I, I think, think the power, the thing that you had going for you was they were listening to every word that you said. Yeah. And, you know, as a writer... You know, I know Mitch from being a writer. They laughed when they should have laughed. Right. Yeah. yeah, they did. And so that was no matter, you know, whatever he was doing, he was, they were still, they was listening. They literally was, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. They came right. to me afterwards and mentioned some stuff. But the reading part was the least nervous that I was. The right. most nervous that I was mm -hmm. is after we, like when we first walked in the door and we came through that like little tunnel or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we came out of there and we got into the yard mm -hmm. and I walked Pass where I used to pump weights and play ball. Like that was from there to the steps of that building was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Right. Like right. this is crazy, right? right. Cause essentially I was walking by myself. Mm -hmm. There was somebody following me, but you right. guys were behind me. So I was right. alone mm -hmm. walking that. And there were, I can hear him going, well, who the fuck is this? Mm -hmm. What is he doing here? What is right. he some, some fucking celeb celebrity now? Like <laughs> most of them probably knew who I was because they have been posting posters for the last two, three months there. Right. right. Okay, okay. So everybody really, realistically, they all knew who I was and why I was there. They just chose not to be in that room. Right. So it was probably a lot of venom. Right. right. In the but you see, the thing is, sometimes there. I know for me, like when sometimes it's hard for me I want to be able to appreciate someone's success and to be there in mm. it. But sometimes if it's something that I want, it can be very difficult for me. And I'll be really yeah. honest with you. It's like, I look at it like if you picture a woman, imagine a woman who wants to have a baby. This mm. is her dream. And she tries a baby. She gets a miscarriage, miscarriage. Mm. You know, she tries fertility treatments. It's not working. Yeah. Okay. And she she may baby. not necessarily want to go to the park and watch seven other women with their babies. Oh, mommy, I love you. Yeah. It's a hard thing. And I know right. for me, if I want it so bad that I can taste it. It's hard for me to enjoy your moment as a photographer when you mm. give your workshop about your trip to Alaska mm. or whatever. I, I, I'm not hating on you. I don't wish you any negativity, but mm. it's just hard for me to be in that room because I want it so bad. And yeah. I think for some of those guys, it could be a case of that where they're like, they want to be you so bad. They want to be free. They want to walk out and be yeah. able to talk to women and eat dinner and whatever and watch TV. Just all these things that own an iPhone. And in there, you are doing it, and it's hard to be there because you want that so bad. But that's different mm -hmm. because that's anybody. Mm -hmm. That's just a free person. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, they, they would have that same venom for the guard because they know the guard is going to no, leave. No, but you free. were in their situation. But that's what I'm saying. This different. is a different thing you know. because mm -hmm. what I did is something they can't conceive of. Like, right. you can conceive of being a free man and fucking a new bitch and right. all that shit. That's a different right. thing than, like, Nobody can, cause I don't bet that any of them ever conceive when I get out of there, out of right. here, I'm going to come back as right. a, as a, whatever I am and right. I'm going to talk Successful to in that field or yeah. whatever. Right. So, and it's not even something I could have conceived of when right. I was in there. There's no possible way right. because that shit don't happen. If I don't know of it happening. Like, I know people come back and they preach to the people, but it's a different thing right. to come back in that capacity. So I can understand, mm -hmm. like, that's a new, Hate. 
Right. It's a brand new hate right. for them if they right. hated it. Yeah, but also there could be some people that have problems dealing with the emotions, period. And that's partially why sure. they're in there, you know? Yeah. But another point that we talk about on the podcast a lot, and I mm-hmm. talked about it with you on number seven the last time you were here, mm-hmm. again, was this idea of personal work and what that is. Yeah. And I think you're a good example mm-hmm. of this because you've written a lot of stuff. You've interviewed a million bikini booty girls in Smooth Magazine. Mm-hmm. I've been with you where we've interviewed... Hey, salute from P. Frank. (laughs) And you've interviewed a ton of artists, a ton of artists and celebrities, Mm -hmm. and you also teach at NYU. But if you really think about it, the only thing that you've ever done that really, really matters, and tell me if I'm wrong, Mm -hmm. is oversold in the residue years, the personal work. And you made the point when you were speaking to the inmates, Mm -hmm. is that a fair term? When you were speaking to the inmates today, you said, I haven't really made a lot of money on this you know, on Oversoul, and you don't know what's going to happen with residue years because mm-hmm. it's not out for another six months. But, again, it's not motivated by money at all. Mm-hmm. It's not what's paying the rent. Mm-hmm. But the only thing that really matters to you is the personal work. And the personal work literally comes from your personal life mm-hmm. and you telling that story. And I urge every single photographer that that's what you really need to be doing. The personal work, making a commitment to it. And I know for me, this is like a personal project because yeah. it's not a money gig. And right. frankly, I lost though. I was <laughs> laughing with you. We get out of the air, we get to yeah. the airport and then like magazine, Hype Paris calling me like, we have a shoot for you. And I lost a studio rental, lost yeah. some BET shooting, but I wanted to be here. And I knew that that was a risk. Mm. But what was going to make it worthwhile wasn't the idea that I was going to make money on your projects. I'm not making money on your project. Right. It was the idea that I'm going to be in that room and be choked up for a moment while I'm photographing something real. And that was really cool. And I think that personal work is the key. And you don't look at the money. You just look at, like, what do you want to shoot? What story can you tell with a camera or with a video camera or with a pen and paper? Mm -hmm. That's the crucial thing, you know? So we wish you best of luck with that for real, all right? So... Thank you for that, all right? So Mitch is going to break out. We're going to talk to Pete Frank, and we're going to bring in Chris. We're going to bring Chris in now if he's free. He's over this there like This guy, hey. ladies and gentlemen, he is the CNN of Brooklyn. He is got to tell him, give a stage, I put stage on the direction and, and shit. He's still on camera, Mitch. Super hilarious. Camera right oh, this now. Is my guy? That's your glass. I might have put my finger in it when I lifted it away. Is yes. there a guy? Okay, um, Chris, if you're watching, free, let's bring you in now. Okay, so we're going to introduce Chris, then we're going to get to you, P. Frank. Well, I don't have no more drink. I need to refresh my cup. Well, well, I don't know if it's kind of party and shit. I don't do this kind of party and shit. But you got to say party with with cocaine and 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 girls. (laughs) Yeah, I'll do radio podcasts and shit. (laughs) We're just talking about all of this. Introduce who you are. You look like you work for the government, though. I don't give a one. Are you white? This is what happens at... I got to say, I'm yeah, minutes after midnight yeah, in Portland, one. okay? Yeah, we've been but working all day, so just, I turned the full shit we off. We actually have. We've been, we've been, we started the day at nine, so nine to nine. Some of us so started so earlier on time. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? We I paid attention to the clock. I'm just, I I'm just saying, you know, seriously, but, you know. In any event, it's definitely been at least about 15 hours, and we actually, we're going to another prison tomorrow. And then we have a three and a half hour drive to the prison. We'll be in the prison a couple hours, three and a half hours yes, sir. out. So busy day tomorrow. But Chris, just do me a favor. Introduce yourself. Tell us what you're doing on a project. Just two or three sentences. And we're going to go to Pete Frank and get back to you. All I get is two or three sentences? For now. We're going to tell your story. <laughs> He's for Boston. He's a gangster. <laughs> we're going to get your story. I Southside. promise. Go. Yeah, shit. Uh, my name is Chris. Yours. Uh, I met Mitchell through... Uh, a good friend of mine who is a composer, uh, who he and Mitch got come closer for me. He and Mitch got uh, they got hooked up uh, somehow through NYU. I'm not sure exactly how it was, but um, he uh, Mitch introduced the project to, to Dave and uh, Dave and, and uh, my brother and I work together um, all the time. Right. Um, so we met uh, we met Mitch in New York. That was the first time I'd ever I'd ever met him, and uh, mm-hmm. he told us about the project. You know, I read his book, or I, I read uh, Oversoul. Right. I hadn't read the rest of the years, mm-hmm. um, and saw the trailer that he put together for uh, for the book. Right. And was um, was blown away by it. You know, right. And here you're what project. would be DP, I guess. Yeah, DP. Um, mm-hmm. My brother and I are. Uh, my brother's gonna cut the thing. No, he's been an editor for twenty something years. 
Um, we have a, a film production company ourselves. And right, right, okay. direct. And so. you've been working super hard. We're going to talk about that in a second. But I want to go to P. Frank first since he's been here for a minute. Okay, so your background, if I just now I met you in LA when I was there with Mitch. We were shooting the game myself and Mitch, and then Mitch wanted to do a piece of this. You got some long game. fucking questions. Well, your questions be hella long. Yeah, and so in 1975, <laughs> it's like, tell me what happened. It's like sitting in front of Congress. <laughs> That's why I gotta watch you and shit. I feel like you're like doing some shit. Like ask me a simple question and I give you an answer. It's gonna be simple. I'm just trying to put this in context. Okay. Okay, Uh, okay. I'm just fucking with you, man. Okay. They're gonna be like, damn, you got some ignorant people on your podcast. In any (laughs) of it, I'm gonna give you the short version. All right. The, The short version would be that we were at your place and you are a producer, and I noticed you had a whole bunch of Source magazine covers on the wall. So. You worked for the source for how long and in what capacity? Well, I worked for the source since 1994 as the West Coast editor. No, I no, no, was just a freelancer. Then I became the West Coast editor, and then I became executive editor uh, in 94 to about 2001. I was wow, that's really long. I was at the beginning. like I wrote the Easy e cover when he died. Mm-hmm. I wrote Tupac's cover when he died. I was at the hospital. Uh, Biggie's cover when he died. Uh, I read my Suge Knight and... And all kind of crazy shit. Really? How hard was it writing for the source? In terms of like, how reliable were the artists when they go, okay, we're going to do this uh, on Tuesday at four? Uh, was that usually there's happening? There's always or the Snoop Dogg rule. Which is? Which is, you know, two is really six. <laughs> you had four hours to the time. Should night rule, which is probably the next day. Um, but generally speaking, it was good. It was a good time in hip hop. I think it was a very, the golden age was kind of ending and it was more into commercial time in hip hop. Hip hop exploded onto the charts, 97, 98, 99. It was the biggest shit. We were selling crazy. We were, we were in the club popping bottles, having, you know, right. our chains. We was wild. And as music was growing, you know, we were, you ever saw, uh, Almost Famous? No. It's the movie about Rolling Stone magazine. No, and Cameron Crowe that, um, no, no, it wasn't that, um. That wasn't almost famous. That was yeah. a different. That's Cameron Crowe's movie. But it's called Most Famous. Same, same, same thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And so it's about this journalist young kid title. who uh, right. is 15 and starts writing for Rolling Stone and being backstage and the girls and the whole right. shit and the drugs and the sex and the guns. And yeah, it's a good movie. I've seen it. Yeah, and so yeah. that's what it was. Right, that's what it was like. Right. What do you think was the hardest piece you did for the source in terms of the most difficult in making it into a cohesive piece because of an uncooperative artist? That's a very loaded. You got some loaded ass question. Um, no, uh, I don't. The difficult thing, just that part of the sentence. Uh, two, there's one which is Suge Knight. I had to go. I had already interviewed him in jail one time in Mills Creek Prison, and I talked to him in a day room, similar to what I did today. And uh, he just was wild and out, calling Magic Johnson a fag, Prince a fag, Arsenio. He just, I didn't want to give him a platform to wild out. And so the second time I interviewed him, he was at death row. He had got out of jail. He was in the death row offices and he had these diamond handcuffs on. He was like piranhas in the back of the desk in a fucking tank. And he just was very, yeah, he was very negative about black people and he just wasn't in a good space. And so, but I had to tell the story and be true to him. And I, in the middle of the piece, I started, it was when the West Coast, East Coast wars were going on hot and heavy. Mm -hmm. And we went to the Four Seasons and he came and he got up there and Mr. Farrakhan was supposed to come and he was supposed to try to be something positive. Dre was supposed to show up, mm-hmm. but he didn't. And in the middle of the piece, I started writing that Louis Farrakhan went on stage and said, this dude is an idiot and that Suge Knight needs to get himself together. And he's a bad portrayal of black people and he's killing right. us with this behavior. And then when it got to, you know, at the owner of the source, he's like, we can't print this. He's like, you can't. He was afraid of Suge. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that was difficult. Most, the second one is probably Tupac. And when Pac died, I felt very close to Pac. I'm born June 17th, 1971. Mm-hmm. Pac was born June 16th, 1971. Literally one day before. Uh, you know, I knew him. Which led to the famous line, June 1671. So when he died, it felt paid. terrible because I felt like he, he was just about to turn the corner. And so it wasn't so much that the story was difficult, but I was at the hospital when he died and all this shit. I was writing for LA Times and I felt like it was a personal moment for me. And I was right. trying to write the story, and I was so caught up, almost like the Mitch situation. I was caught up emotionally mm-hmm. to try to figure out this life, which was still kind of my life, but somebody else's. And I really felt like if he would have had like two more years of his life, he would have turned the corner from the pain and the negativity and become someone totally different. Mm-hmm. So for me, those are two of the more powerful. I mean, there's Snoop and all kind of you know shit that I wrote, but right. emotionally and 
content wise. Right. Now, how did you transition? Because right now you have what's a pretty different job because again, you're working in television because the, the program you produce is called unseen, which unsung. airs unsung. I'm yeah. sorry. Cause it's a music artist unsung airs on TV one. Mm. And prior to that, you were doing American gangster. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. Which is a television series, the right? Documentary series on B, that right. air on BET. Now I think I saw it on BET. Yeah. Right. Is that where it originated? Yes. Okay, so it was on BET, and I saw it, and basically it would tell criminal stories. And my favorite one, I mean, you probably know which one it is, but it was so funny. It was these guys, they were on work release, and then they would put them out, like, in the in the real world, let's say, like, every Friday or something for, like, the whole day. And they were supposed to have these jobs. Oh, yeah, my and boy it, from Queens. Okay, and then uh, with sneak, the black hand. I forgot his name. I'm blanking on his name right now. So you know this. Yeah, and they yeah. would sneak away, and they would rob banks. Yeah, and they come and back they, in jail. And here's my favorite part of that story. So when they would do the profile of the bank robbers, it fit these certain criminals. And then when the feds looked them up, they said, it can't be them. They're locked up. So it can't be these guys. Right, right. And nobody put it together that they were on work release and robbing the banks while they were in That's jail. Gangster, huh? It was hilarious. Yeah. But how did you transition, though, from print journalism into doing television production on American Gangster and now Unsung? Um, I met some really beautiful white women. I just kissed on them. It has and, to be more and, complicated than that. And just was like, damn, baby, you know, can you give me a job? It has to be more yeah, complicated. See, I've, done that. I've done the same thing. Yeah. It didn't get me anywhere. Yeah. Right. It got me in trouble, actually. Right. It got you to Portland, Oregon, talking right. to you. Right. So, right. 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 so it didn't really, like, nothing. So nothing happened. Right. <laughs> no, I, uh, How did you make the transition? Well, actually, when I was in college, I went to Columbia University Journalism School. And so I studied television journalism before I became a writer. And I worked at the LA Times for seven years as a reporter. And as I was at the end, sort of, of that, I was writing for hip-hop simultaneously as I was a reporter at the paper. And so I finally left the paper to become an editor at The Source because I got paid a lot more money. And we did The Source Awards, like, 99? 99. Mm-hmm. And so I had to work in print and then magazines. And then it was like, we're doing The Source Awards. I was like, well, just like, well, you want to write it? Or I was like, okay, I'll write it. And so I wrote the show, and then I ended up producing it. And I ended up being back producing direct, you know, Next thing I know, I'm producing other shows, fucking BT Awards, and mm-hmm. then it becomes American Gangster, then it becomes a film, and then it becomes documentaries, and it becomes webisodes. And so, you know, I think for me, as long as you can tell a story, you could do whatever. Right. Now, on Unsung, you're taking artists that aren't necessarily in their prime. Big Daddy Kane, Ghetto Boys. Um, Sheila E., who did Fat Boys. Right. Uh, Rest of Development. And telling that story, yeah. which leads you to travel a lot because they're not all just based in Atlanta or something. Right. You live in LA, so you end up traveling a lot. How hard is that on your personal life and personal relationships? Is this Us Weekly? What the fuck? Okay, <laughs> it's everything. It's camera this work, is, podcast, uh, episode number 10. I don't understand what the fuck, how this relates to camera work. <laughs> you have strayed so far. It has to do. No. I'm gonna t- let me tell you the connection. It's actually <laughs> called digression. <laughs> No. What the fuck is this? I'm going to tell you. No, is this reality. your story? This is your like no. story arc? I'm no. just wondering. I'm going to tell you what the okay, what okay. really is. It's I don't really question. want to answer that question. Oh, no, that's Move to the next question. Yeah. No, that's completely fine. But I will tell you what the connection is, though, okay. is that there's several themes we do on a podcast. One of them is personal work. One is like that you should always be learning. Right. Another theme on the podcast is the idea of like not ever putting on fronts and pretending you're perfect. Like when the, the guy who usually co-hosts with me, Ray Tomorrow. Well, I'm a, I'd rather come back in New York. For right. my part two, when he's we there, you're there in your studio, but, but and the, we can be better. Right, we can do that. But but the, the point of it, though, is one of the other themes of the podcast is the idea of work. Right. So I'm always trying to stress how much work is. Because, see, everybody wants this job. Like, they look at it like, oh, you know, you're photographing pretty girls and rock stars, and everybody wants to be a photographer. Do, right? Yeah, that's what I do, and it's great, but... A lot of people don't realize the work part of it. They you just really work hard. The fuck. Think so? I think it's hard work. And we're going to go to Chris. I'm going to jump to Chris. Because this is the hard part of Chris. I'm sorry, I've got to leave. Can break i got to get cool. another drink. Talk to Chris. Let's go. You can step over. I can step over. I'm sorry. I know I was a rude guest. Right. No, you were perfect. Thank you. That's Pete Frank. Also known <laughs> Frank bring, bring the bottle back. Exactly right. right. This is the perfect time to segue. Do me a favor. Just lean in closer to the mic so you're kind of like the way I am. But uh, we can segue right to you because when we're talking about this whole thing, gotten up. One of the interest, and we're going to ask our. Don't We're going to ask Mitch and P. Frank to keep it down for audio. <laughs> Thank you. But one of the things that's interesting, again, is the idea of work, mm-hmm. is that 
you are working tremendously hard on this project. And it's funny because you and I are both on a project, mm -hmm. and again, to a large degree, we're working on this project out of enjoying the concept of it and wanting to do it mm -hmm. rather than, you know, because it's like so much of a paid gig. Mm -hmm. But I think video is a ton more work than still photography, you know, and there was yeah, a it's a different process, sure. But it's just, just more work, period. And I admire the way you work. Like I'm saying to myself, man, if I got a project for video, this is the guy I'm gonna call because I appreciate the way you work and knowledgeable about what you're doing, mm -hmm. but you're working really, really hard. And like I held the camera and did one of the interviews because the other second camera guy had to leave. I held it for like fifteen minutes and it was killing me. Like my arm was hurting like crazy. How do you hold a camera for that period of time without it hurting you? Well I mean it's still close again. It still hurts, but I mean, you know, uh I guess it's just something you just get used to, you know. Right. The guy was telling you, and I was joking, but I was serious. I said, I think if I had to do video, half the time I would be trying to sell the client on the idea of just doing it as a tripod shot. <laughs> yeah, I would just be like, you know, yeah. I think it would fit the mood of the scene better to have it on a tripod because it would represent the uh, staticness of the story. Because I would not want to handhold it for like a 45 minute interview. It just yeah. like a ton of work. Well, t I mean, like typically with interviews, it's not handheld, but for this project, uh, it's, it's usually on sticks. But for this project, we, you know, we wanted to stay true. Nick, uh, uh, Mitch had uh, uh, had filmed interviews before, and he had a, you know he had a handful of uh, you know of, uh, of material that he had collected before uh, right. before I got involved and whatever. So right. um, the idea was that we, and also in keeping with the story, you know, his story with the environment, whatever else, we wanted to keep it a little you know a little bit more raw, a little bit more visceral. Right. right. Um, and then you're doing yeah, it's much more handheld. cinema veritas. So we we're, right. we're going we're going handheld with all. Uh, we decided to go handheld with all the interviews. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Right. So. But the other thing that, if I understand correctly, did you not you trans you transformed from still photography into video? Is that correct? Well, I actually uh, I started in cinematography. I went I went to school for cinematography back in the days when we were shooting you know sixteen we were shooting film. It was before digital video. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this was like I went to I was in B, I was at BU in the late nineties. So I was mm -hmm. I learned on. Uh, you know, like Bolexes shooting, you know, Super 8 and 16 and, you know, and 35. Um, I learned to edit on Steenbeck's, you know, again, this is before Final Cut or Avid or whatever. Uh, and when, when I finished with that, I realized that it was just, uh, the whole process was far too, um, time consuming and cost prohibitive for me to be able to, to, to do anything as an artist, uh, on my own. Right. So at that point, and I always wanted to do, I was always interested in telling other people's stories. Right. Uh, so I, I transitioned from, from what I thought was going to be documentary filmmaking. Right which was beginning. actual film, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, wasn't digital, was, it was film. No, this was film, yeah. Right, which is a tremendously expensive and oh, yeah. time consuming and yeah, stuff. Yeah, for a right. kid coming out, you know, with, with $75,000 worth of college debt, coming out of, you know, school right. and being like, there's, fucking, there's no fucking chance I'm going to be able to do anything. Right. So I transitioned into photojournalism. I went back, I traveled for a year, went back to school for photojournalism. Right. And, then, and you were shooting film, or were we digital by that point? I, was, I started out shooting film, and then right. I transitioned to. Uh, I bought the the first Canon digital, uh, like professional digital camera. It was a four right. megapixel camera, right? You know, but that it was still like four like grand. This. It was yeah. a one D, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought it was the greatest thing ever, but right, you know, it's a paperweight and it's now. And then you're still on Canon for some god unknown reason. And when yeah. I filmed today, I had to use a Canon. It was. Well, yeah, that's, Mitch, wash my that's Mitch's after. camera. That's Mitch's camera. Yeah. Okay. Mine would have been an icon. But yeah. uh, you transitioned out. So how did you make the transition away from still photography into video? Because you're primarily doing video now. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, well, uh, my brother's 10 years older than me. Um, it was always our, our plan to go into business together. He's been he's been in the business forever. And um, uh, it was basically just put on hold until, you know, until technology caught up and... Uh, you know, we could do what we wanted to do without, you know, overextending ourselves and without massive budgets and, you know, huge, huge crews and whatever else. So. Right. And see, my problem has been I'm not averse to video. I don't, I don't dislike it as a medium of telling a story. My issue with video is always that it's more time consuming to create it. Oh, yeah. There's this entire editing component, which takes <clears> 10 <throat> times longer than the filming part. Yeah. And you need so many people. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, 
I started off doing this project with Mitch, and I think we did pretty good. We didn't do fantastic, but it's just me and Mitch, me doing every part of it alone, the lighting, the camera, the right. That's a lot. everything, the sound, you know, and it wasn't good enough for him to produce the documentary, so we end up now with, and what are we working with on this project now? We have like six people at least, yeah, there's, there's if six, not more. Six or eight, yeah, and then, uh, yeah. Right, and that's the yeah. thing that kind of bothers me, and you know, like you look at the trip like... What did you bring? I mean, let's talk about what we brought for this trip. What you brought versus what I brought, right? So, what did you bring on this trip? Well, I mean, I it's 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 different though. I mean, I I always I try to bring more than, of course, right. what I expect I'm going to need just in right. case. But what I did to answer your question, I brought uh, I brought my camera rig, which is which which what's the main camera you're using? Uh, Sony FS100, right? Um, with uh, Canon EF lenses, right? Um, L series lenses. So I had two cases uh, for camera and accessories. Right, but you brought a Canon body too, didn't you? Or are you using the five D that I Mitch did, has? I did bring. I brought. I brought my Canon body, but we right. we have been using Mitch's five D. Right, and then Mitch also has a five D. Right, you brought a lighting kit, an RE lighting kit. I brought my RE light kit. I brought right. uh, two grip kits. Right, and. Uh, that's it, and that's like right. that's pared down for me. Right, but that was a total of three cases. I checked three cases and right. carried three, two on. And yet two on. You're right. Whereas I brought just the Leica M9, and I brought a <laughs> 21, 24, 35, 50, and a 75. Yeah. And I brought a softbox and a flash and two pocket wizards. Yeah. And that was basically it. And I felt like I was bringing a lot of stuff. I had bought, barely brought any clothes because yeah. I'm like, well, I got too much baggage. I don't want to. And you almost threw one of them out today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Which is not a good idea. No. But th that, again, that's the thing. That's that difference with video versus photography is that it's so much more complicated to yeah. do video. And for me, the hard part is getting the money back at the end of it to make it worthwhile. Yeah, that I needed all these people and all this gear and all this time that you need to be billing it at rates that are so much higher than still photography that yeah. that always becomes the stumbling block for me and every now and then I say I'm going to get into video now and I I jump in it for like six months and you know I'll go with Ray who usually co-hosts the podcast with me in New York Ray Tamara and you know we'll go out we'll do a couple of music videos and all of this stuff and then I, I just start hitting those walls, and then I just stop, and I go back to still photography, which consistently makes me money, and it doesn't yeah. kill me to do it. Well, you know, I mean, I think uh, it's all in the approach. <clears throat> I know a lot of you – know, I've, I've, worked, I've worked the last uh, the last 10 years in, in photography, you know, first in photojournalism and then in, uh, in you know, editorial and commercial. <laughs> and uh, it's all – it's just the approach. You out? Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. I'll see you guys later. Okay. Um, you said it's all in the approach. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I know a lot of photographers who have never touched, you know, until about two years ago, had never touched a video camera and right. had no concept for video workflow. But because that's because the uh, because of technology, you know, hardware and software right. cameras and, and you know editing and LEs, whatever, uh, you know, the, the two two industries are sort of uh, I don't want to say merging. But you know, if they were if they were paralleled, you know, at, at, at a greater distance before, now it's it's far closer. Right. A lot of clients, particularly commercial clients, expect both. Yeah, you know, right. because as you said, there are cameras like, you know, HDSLRs that will shoot high definition video. Right, you can yeah. do both. And fortunately, the new Leica does get yeah. video, so I'm happy. I can do a little video when I get that one eventually. Right, but just because you can, right, doesn't mean that everybody should. Well, uh, you the, know, the funny thing to me was I. I videotape a lot of my shoots, or videotape may not be the right word, but I film a lot of my photo shoots. And it's yeah. funny to me how many times I've had a photographer that I'll just kind of draft, you know, just be like, hey, come down and just run some video of my shoot so I can throw a 10 minute clip on YouTube of me shooting mindless behavior or whatever. Yeah. And they're photographers and they're absolutely horrible at yeah. shooting video. You think it would transfer, like if a guy's a really good still shooter, yeah. that he could just do a 10 minute video clip of like, behind the scenes of a photo shoot and so many of them can't they don't yeah. understand the difference in like camera motion or yeah. how to all of a sudden they forget how to frame a shot like all of a sudden the heads are in the middle of the frame and half the frame is wasted yeah well like, I mean if you stop and think about it I mean it's, it's the difference between one frame you know to tell your story and mm -hmm. 24 or 30 a second right. You right. know and and as you said I mean like camera movement camera motion you trying to think trying to tell a story linearly uh, you know over course of however many seconds or minutes is 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 vastly different from from you know like what uh 
you know, Cartier Bresson called the the decisive moment. Right, like, like one second. Yeah, right. you know, like you as a, and I think I, I definitely I have a love for both. Uh, you know, uh, I I can't tell you which one I like better or you know which one I think is more effective because they're both you know done properly. They're both incredibly effective. Right, but. You know, you you definitely said it. I mean, uh, we were talking about it earlier today. It's like you know the the difference between, like you said, you you can bring a, a bag of cameras. I'm wearing it. It's barely even a bag. I got yeah. four Leica lenses on my shoulder, on my waist, yeah, and a body on my shoulder, and a lens on the camera, and I'm done. And yeah. it's so it's beautiful. It's so yeah. much fun. Well, it's you know it's it's crazy because some you know sometimes because uh, I still shoot stills, uh, and sometimes I'll be shooting stills, and I'll, I'll find myself in a situation where I'm like, oh my god. I wish I had, you know, I wish I had my video camera with me, right. like, because this is, this would be so, this story would be so much better told right. at 24 frames a second. Right. You know, as opposed to one. And other times I'm shooting video and I'm like, fuck this. This is obnoxious. Like right. this story would be so much better told with right. a single picture. With just one shot. We get yes. done with this. Right? Yes, exactly. This. Right. But you know what? That's right. just. Right. Such but, is life. Uh, the other thing for me on the trip that was a little bit new was I discovered Vine. I think a lot of times when I travel, I like to do something different. Like I'll try a new camera. Yeah, a new I'm discovering lens. this through you. Yeah, right. So yeah. I went crazy and I, I started the first day I shot like 15 Vine clips. <laughs> I shot like 15 Vine clips. I got a total of two likes by the second day for all the clips put together. It's not bad. It's, it's not, not bad. bad. It's right. not bad. But it's two more than I had before I joined right. Vine, right? Right. You know, but. Uh, I thought Vine was really interesting. I didn't know what it was. All I knew was that it was a five-second video clip, and I kept thinking, well, I don't know. It just seems kind of goofy. Like, what do you do? Go like, hey, greetings from Portland for five seconds, but, yeah, but it's not that at all. It, it's it's interesting. Do you agree with that? I do. I do. Yeah. Right. So what Vine does for anyone who hasn't checked it out is this. It's a five-second video clip, but the way you film it, the way the interface is designed is – you touch the screen, and when you touch the screen, you're filming. And then you're supposed to really film, like, say, two seconds, and then three seconds, and then one second, and then another second. Now, when you watch back the video, this five second has maybe five different clips in it or three different clips. And you can do different things. Like, I find it's kind of cool. Let's say you do, like, one second on someone's shoes. Then the next two or three seconds, you go from their shoes and you pan. Is that the right word? Tilt. Tilt. I tilt up from the shoes all the way up to the person's face. And then the last two seconds, you do like a still or locked off shot. There you go. Nice. <laughs> do nice. a lock off shot on the face. So you're kind of combining a little motion and some not motion and creating a really interesting video clip. And you get the sound as well. And yeah. I'm, I'm in love with Vine. I wish somebody was looking at my Vine. Well, there will be now. Oh, I it's, hope so. It, what Vine is, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like filmmaking lingo, is right. is just e it's in camera editing. Right. You know, like uh, right. we when you when you're when you're a film student, right? Uh, there 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 are camera. Well, at least one. This was a while back when I was a film student. Um, there was a camera called a Bolex. Right. And what it was was a 16 millimeter camera that uh, I mean it was really really cheap. And it gave uh, it gave really good results. I mean, like you, you know, and you you'd ha you could load it in your bathroom. You right. Know? Like you didn't need complete darkness. You didn't need a loading right. bag to. And uh, and one of the first assignments we ever got was was literally to you know we had to you had to again to to, to train your you know to train somebody to think linearly in terms of you know like a film. You had to like storyboard basically you know to right. whatever to however whatever many however many minutes of whatever the role was so let's just say two minutes you had to storyboard a two minute film right because you had a, a specific amount of frames right. and then uh you weren't able to cut like physically cut and, and splice right. the film you know so like you had to and you only had one shot to get it so this is, this is like right. but you had to camera. turn in basically that whole roll of film that's it yeah right. without so so like you know you had like for instance the, the exact same thing as vine you know like you would have your actors and you'd block everything off and you know and then you you roll for however long that right. you know and then cut and and that would be it and right. then you'd have to move on to your next to scene. To the next shot. Yeah, and it's kind of fun. You yeah. know, and especially with the phone because it doesn't cost you any money. Whereas with the film, <laughs> yeah, it's a whole yeah exactly. Thing, you know? yeah. So I'm liking that app a lot. And I think I'm going to stay with it a decent amount. It may start to replace Instagram for me yeah. at some point. Excuse me. Especially since for me, most of my Instagram comes off my Leica with the iFi card. Yeah. I don't really use the phone for Instagram. Hardly yeah. ever. So 
I may start using the phone for Vine as my version of Instagram. Yeah. You know, and then I think the, it's uh, by the same. It's by the same people, right? It. I don't know, but it's connected to Twitter completely. So it's completely it's integrated. integrated into yeah. Twitter. So it's it's like when you use Instagram, you feel like you're still on Twitter, even though they're right. It's they're, just pictorial Twitter. Twitter. Right, but I think they're kind of at war with each other or something. I think they're not really friends or something. I don't know. But the other app that I really like, and we talked about this on a podcast a couple of podcasts ago, or no, I think it might have been the last podcast, number nine, is called One Second Every Day. And I think I showed you my feed, correct? Yeah, I haven't seen your feed, but we talked about it. Okay, I am in love with this app. You, yeah, you shoot great. a video clip and then you use the app to edit it down to one second. Yeah. And although it can be a little frustrating, because sometimes you want three seconds or two seconds to communicate what you're trying to communicate, yeah. I really, really like it. And I've done it consistently from March 5th till today, which is March 23rd. So I don't know what, what that is. It's two weeks, three weeks almost. Yeah, just about. About three weeks. And it's exciting because I find that I end up trying to figure out, well, what's going to be the clip? Like the day I was going to go to Portland, the first thing I thought was like, well, I got to get a Portland shot. Like I'll be flying in the air or mm -hmm. the sign that says, welcome to Portland because I went somewhere. Let me put that in my one second for the day. And then I said, no, the clip should be like me saying goodbye to my daughter because yeah. that's so special. Like, I know she's going to cry. Yeah. She's the only person who cries when I leave. Nobody else cares. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but that's what's great about a daughter. At least someone does. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, only a daughter cares when you leave, you yeah. know. So, but, so I'm thinking, like, well, I want the clip to be my daughter crying. You know, and then you start thinking about the day, like, well, what is the special moment of the day? What is the one second that I want to remember yes, from this that's, day? That's maddening to me. Yeah, it, it's really cool, and it does make you start to think, and then, like, like if you look at it, like, okay, it's been three weeks, and my mother, no, actually, the clip ended up being my mother who drove me to the airport. That was the clip I finally chose for that day, because I was, like, feeling guilty that my mother wasn't on it yet, and it was almost three <laughs> weeks. I'm like, well, my mother should be on it, because I've got, like, Pagey on from BET. <laughs> she got on it on, like, day three, you know? Like, so you start thinking about all this stuff in your life about, like, well, what do you want to remember from your life and what's important and how are you spending your time? Yeah. And imagine the day where you can't find a one-second clip that's worthwhile. Well, what that's was that sad. day worth? I mean, yeah. see, I, mean, I mean, yeah, I guess that's that's subjective. Like, I don't think, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's just the way I look at it, but, you know, just got to... Man, I forget where I read it or who told me it, but uh, some, somehow, somewhere, I came across uh, uh, a quote that was, um, uh, uh, do something important today uh, because you're trading a day of your life for it. Right. And, you know, it's like that's – I've always since, – since the day – I don't even remember when it was. It was a long time ago. But since right. the day I heard that, that I, I've, I've taken that to heart. I mean, if you right. can't find – a second right. of your day, right. <laughs> you know, it's like right. important or poignant or at very least beautiful, right. then you might as well just old yeah. yell at yourself. What are you doing? Because, right. Yeah. So I think I recommend that app to people. And I think I may, I probably made this point last podcast to say it again. Um, I think I'll stick with this app because you think, the thing about the iPhone is there's so many apps, right? And like you're on the iPhone too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every day somebody comes to you, oh my God, you got to see the panorama app. And then you use it and you're like, this is incredible. I can do a panorama and it's like yeah. 10,000 pixels. It's higher yeah. res than my Canon file yeah. or whatever. Next thing you know, it's an hour of your day. Yeah. Right. But then a week later, you're not using it. You right. don't care. You right. just, you can move on to another app because somebody goes, oh, there's a 360 panorama app right. and that's even better. And you go to that and... You know, you don't really stick with these things. Again, at least I don't. And, you know, I've got all these different apps and features. But I think the one second every day I'm going to stick with, because I think it's the one that is really personal and designed for yourself. And when I do Instagram, I don't really feel I'm doing it for me. I feel I'm doing Instagram for people to see my work. I'm trying right. to show, look at what I shot or something. Right. I'm sharing things to other people. Right. But I think the one second every day is an app that is – really about me. I'm just doing it for me to look at the clips. That's all I think about. Or I think about my daughter looking at those clips one day if I weren't here. Right. And I, again, I'm only three weeks into it. You know, I could still be in a honeymoon phase, but I really <laughs> believe like a year from now, I will You're still, still be, be doing, doing that. Yeah, shit. I'm going to be doing, even though I don't use the 360 pano and I don't use the regular yeah. panel and all these other apps I've downloaded. You know, they come and go. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to stay with this one. There's one dude out there. I mean, the, first, the, way, the way that I was introduced to it is uh, uh, somebody sent me uh, this dude's feed, and he did it for a year. One there second. might have been the one who invented it. His name is Caesar or something. Yeah, that's – okay, so that makes yeah. sense. But, you know, it's like 
Yeah. It wasn't... It, I don't remember having the same uh, emotional reaction to it. Do you remember the dude... This was back... This must have been back in 2004, 2005. The dude that took a picture of himself every day for like... Yeah, that just... You don't want to do that, though. <laughs> no, no. But like... But I remember watching that and, uh, you know, yeah, oh boy, like, she no. shot himself for like three or four years. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I was... I thought that it was yeah. like... It was to put no. to some like Mozart... And I thought yeah. it was beautiful. It was moving. No, I, I, that's too sad. I don't. Yeah, do but that. no, but no. see, like, so, like, when <laughs> I know? when I watched that, when I watched this dude's um, one second a day feed, I right. thought it was like, you know, it, it had. I thought it was just as cool, but it wasn't as serious. You know, it was like right. he had all sorts of fun stuff in there. Yeah, there were like fireworks and like parties. Yeah. Like mine's not gonna be parties. No, it's like it's parties, like a it's like a little it's like a mini video yeah. diary. Yeah, but th- that thing of like just watching yourself get age old until the grave. I mean, like <laughs> this doesn't have a happy ending. This story that we're living. No. I'm sorry. It, yeah, you're supposed to forget that way. shit at some point. Right? <laughs> you know, like I don't want to do that. Ignore story. the fact that you're getting older every yeah. day. But they have apps for that though. That you can do that picture a day that help you line it up so that when yeah. you do the edit the photos are kind of consistent in terms of the size of you yeah. and the, where your eyes are lined up yeah so those apps are amazing and like the one second every day app it's 99 cents like yeah, that's a steal you think you could carry a device just to do one second every day like that should be like you should have a whole iphone okay. just for that yeah. it's such a cool thing so i'm recommending that to everybody including you because you've seen the video but for some reason you haven't jumped on it so well, i got you, I, you brought on. up the one the picture day you know, and I, and I bought that when my when my daughter was born. The one so, second every day, you mean? No, the the my wife got the one second every day. Okay, and I got uh, the pick a day because I well, wanted, of yourself. No, no, because I wanted to shoot my daughter. Oh, you want so to I'm shoot like, her one picture every yeah. day? Now that's cool if she's like under yeah. one or so. How old is she? She's young. She's four months old. Oh God, yeah, I already that fucked kid it up. Cool. So. Oh, <laughs> you it? yeah, actually, I never see? started. Oh, there you go. See, I mean, I guess yeah. I can start now. It's but the problem cool. is, we have too much choice that that's what messes us up we have too many apps that we never dive deep into them okay. at all and it, it's kind of a shame we have yeah. so much that you know and like it, it's kind of a shame and if we could strip it down a little like if you could take your like if they told you you could only have five apps on your phone we'd probably be better off we would do those five apps but yeah. we've all got 50 apps and we don't even look at half of them yeah you know and you've probably had that experience. You go to download an app and then you realize you already have it. And you're like, oh, yeah. I know right. I bought this already. I never yeah, used it. Yeah, so I've already not liked this. <laughs> yeah, I've already not done anything with it. So right. what am I going to do with it now? Oh, super. Know? All right. But anyway, Chris, I, I, again, I respect watching you work because you know your craft. You know what <laughs> you're doing. Funny. And you're dedicated because we wrapped today with Mitch and the mom at like, what, like 10, 1030. Yeah. Right? And then I said to P. Frank, I want you to do the podcast. Let's go back to Mitch's room. We'll do the podcast. We'll get a pizza because I'm hungry. That was the only thing on my mind. <laughs> and you said to Mitch, wait a minute. Mind you again, we started at like 9 a.m. this morning. Well, I started at 6. Okay, you started 6 a.m. But now this is 10 p.m. at night. And then when I was going back to get the pizza, you said to Mitch, hey, give me 10 minutes. I got to go get this shot. What was it, like a bridge or something? No, I went and shot uh, uh, these basketball courts at a place where he used to... Right. He used to go play when he was a kid. Right. So I, I admire that work ethic that you have and that you know what you're doing. That's really cool. I hope you continue to do that. And like I said, when I got a video project and they go, like, <laughs> we need a video guy, I'm going to be like, Chris, that's, that's my boy. I'm going to call him because he knows what he's doing and he works hard at it. So that. where do they find you on Twitter or the web or anything <clears throat> like that? Uh, they, well, uh, my personal site is ChristopherEwers.com. Right. It's E-W-E-R-S. It's my last name. Okay. And uh, the film site uh, from, with me and my brother is ewersbrothers.com. Got it. All right. And you can find me on Vine. And that would be nice because no one has found me on Vine <laughs> yet. But it's just John Ricard, J-O-H-N-R-I-C-A-R-D, which is the same name for my Instagram. The Twitter is John Ricard NYC. Okay. So you can find me there if you'd like. Okay. And if not, find us on, po- on Camera Work Podcast. You know, just... Tell us what you like and we'll keep doing it. All right. So thank you, Chris. Thank you to P. Frank, who's not here right now. And thank you to Mitch. And we'll see you guys next week.